my dear friends in Christ, we had as the topic of our first conference, Lent, the spirit of Lent, and the value, the importance of mortification and acts of penance. In our second conference, we were speaking about the passion of our Lord, the value of meditating on the passion of our Lord, and especially the lessons we can learn, the virtues that our Lord gives us the example of, which we must try to imitate. And in this third conference, I would like primarily to speak about prayer, the importance of prayer, the value of prayer. We could say that prayer is to the soul what breathing is to the body. We need to breathe in order to take in oxygen for the functioning of the body. Without, without it, we would die. So likewise, without prayer, the soul would die. And we must learn to pray well. We can always strive to pray better than we have prayed, with attention, with recollection. And I would like especially to address a topic in this regard that is very important, and that is what are the conditions for successful prayer? So often we say, well, I, I pray for this or that, and I didn't receive it. And we get discouraged. Well, perhaps we did not meet all the conditions for a successful prayer. Now, I'm going to take this from a book by Father Michael Mueller called Prayer, the Key to Salvation. And if you've never read this book, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful book on prayer with different stories, examples. And he has this chapter, actually kind of a lengthy chapter, on the conditions for successful prayer and the qualities of prayer. So let's go through that. The first, he says, the object of our prayer must be lawful. <clears throat> so in other words, if somebody prayed for something that was not in accordance with God's commandments, he certainly would not receive it. And especially also if, somewhat, if someone prays for something that is not for the good of his soul, Almighty God being a loving father, being a good father, would not give that or grant that petition to this person. So for example, if someone prays to win the lottery, he or she wants to win the lottery and buys tickets, etc. Well, God knows that if this person won the lottery, he might or she might become engrossed in the things of this world, discontinue praying, discontinue leading a good Catholic life. God would not give that person or grant that person's request. It's kind of like a little child is watching his mother in the kitchen and she's cutting up vegetables or whatever and he sees that shiny knife and he wants it and reaches out and wants that knife. She wouldn't give it to him because it's not for the good of this child. Well, we are like that child insofar as our understanding. We only see what we see in this world. We don't see what's behind it. We could say that God sees the whole picture and he orders things and arranges things for the salvation of souls, the salvation of the elect. And so sometimes things are allowed by God in our lives and we don't understand why. Perhaps it is not for the good of our immortal soul to have that cross, that trial removed. It is part of God's plan for our perfection, our sanctification, our spiritual well-being. So the first condition for successful prayer is to pray especially what may be for the good of the soul rather than material things. Now we can pray for material things. We can pray for health. We can pray for material blessings to find a job and so forth. But primarily we must pray for the good of the soul. And in this regard, there's one other aspect to it, the object of our prayer, and that is to pray for oneself. And what I mean by that is we can 
and should pray for others. And if we pray for others, God will hear that prayer and he will give them grace. But he doesn't take away their free will. They have to correspond with it. And that's why sometimes you're praying for a loved one. And it seems like your prayer is not doing any good. Well, be assured God is giving that soul graces and continue to pray. But no one can take away that person's free will. He or she must cooperate with grace. So we must continue to pray, but realize that even though God gives the grace, that person must cooperate. So the first condition, again, of a successful prayer is to pray what's for the good of the soul. And that while we can pray for material blessings, temporal blessings, God will give them only as it is in accord with his holy will that is for the good of the soul. The second condition of prayer is that it must be humble. And this is so important. We have to have a deep conviction of our total dependence on Almighty God. We are completely dependent on God. He is our creator. He loves us. He provides for us. But of ourselves, we can do nothing. St. Teresa of Avila said something very interesting. She said, any time I really wanted something, I would especially humble myself before asking for it, and I would always receive it. So God inclines to the humble. He rejects the proud. He gives his grace to the humble. So we have to humble ourselves. We have to remind ourselves of our complete dependence upon Almighty God and remind ourselves that anything of good that we have, whether it's talents or abilities, whether it's virtues, good works, we can't do any of this without God's assistance. So we humble ourselves, calling to mind our sinfulness, our infidelities, our weakness, and then God inclines to our prayer. He comes down to us. This is why our Blessed Mother was so pleasing to Almighty God because she was so humble. And she did not deny what he had done for her, but she gave God all the credit. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he who is mighty has done great things to me. So at her beautiful prayer, the Magnificat, that she said when Elizabeth praised her, she did not deny that God had done great things for her, to her, but she gave him all the credit. So let us make certain that our prayers are humble. Now the third condition, our prayer must be fervent. So if we really have a deep conviction of what we need, what we want, what is for our spiritual good, we will ask it fervently. It won't be haphazardly, it won't be in a lukewarm matter, manner, but rather it will be in a fervent way. And the author here says, St. Bernard once saw an angel of the Lord write down in a book the divine praises of each of his brethren in the monastery while they were reciting the divine office. Some were written in letters of gold, others in letters of silver, others in letters of ink, and some with water. So it signified the degree of their fervor. And he says, the divine praises of some of St. Bernard's brethren were not even written down at all. But instead of the chanted psalms, the following words were written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Quoting Isaiah the prophet. So you had these different degrees of, of merit, of value, of grace given to these monks depending on how fervently they prayed their office. So when we ask, when we pray, we must pray with fervor, with an effort to be attentive, to be devout in our prayers. So fervor, so humility, praying for what is especially for the good of the soul, and praying with fervor. The next condition that he gives here, our prayer must be followed by amendment of life. Imagine the prayer of one who is addicted to a habit of sin. 
and doesn't want to give it up. And he prays for something. How is God going to answer the prayer of this person who is determined to continue to live a life of sin? It makes no sense. God, so to speak, would be fighting against himself if he would grant the prayers of those individuals. Rather, they should pray humbly for the grace to want to amend their lives, the grace to seriously strive to amend their lives. They should pray, but they should pray for that grace of conversion and repentance. So our prayer must be followed by amendment of life. The fifth condition, then, that he gives, our prayer must be united with forgiveness of injuries. Now that's a hard thing. Forgiving everyone who has offended us. Again, we have the words of our Lord after he was nailed to the cross. His first word, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And one of the best examples of forgiveness by a saint, disciple of our Lord, who learned from the master, was the first martyr. Saint Stephen was a deacon, one of the first seven deacons, and he was the first martyr of the church. And remember that the Sanhedrin took up stones and they stoned him. He he gave them a, a, a sermon, standing before the Sanhedrin, and he quoted different persons and events from the Old Testament and showed how our Lord fulfilled them, that Jesus is truly the Son of God. And then he looked up and he saw a vision. He saw the heavens opened and our Lord seated at the right hand of the Father. And he told them that. I see the heavens open and I see Jesus seated at the right hand of God. And they were just beside themselves. And they took him out of the city and stoned him to death. But as he was dying, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He forgave them. Imagine being able to forgive at a time like that. And the author of this book here talks about that act of St. Stephen and says that prayer earned for the church St. Paul. Because St. Paul consented to this stoning. He did not cast stones, but he kept the garments. Those who did took off their cloaks and they laid them at the feet of Saul. And for him to stand there keeping watch over their garments was a way of showing approval. You know, we can sin not just by committing sin, but by participating, cooperating in different ways, encouraging. And so St. Paul was guilty of that. But he also achieved the benefit of the prayer of Stephen to lay not this sin to their charge. St. Augustine says, had he not prayed, the church would not have gained the apostle, referring to St. Paul. St. Mary Oigny, whilst in a rapture, saw how our Lord presented St. Stephen with the soul of St. Paul before his death on account of the prayer which the former had offered him. She saw how St. Stephen received the soul of this apostle, the moment of his death, and how he presented, presented it to our Lord, saying, Here, Lord, I have the immense and most precious gift which you gave me. Now I return it to you with great interest. In many instances, St. Stephen has proved to be a most powerful intercessor and patron of all those who wish to convert, not only their enemies, but also other obstinate sinners. God granted him this power for his zeal, his example, and his martyrdom. Let us often invoke him to pray for our enemies as he did for his. And pray to St. Stephen to give you the grace to be forgiving, Sometimes we can harbor just even a little bit of resentment toward those who have offended us. But what did our Lord say? He said, when you come to offer your gift at the altar and you remember that you have anything against your brother, go first to be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So that is why the author here says prayer, it's the fifth condition, for it to be acceptable, to God, it must be accompanied by forgiveness of injuries, forgiveness of our enemies and praying them, praying for them. Number six, 
Our prayer must be united with good works. So we spoke about in the, I think the first conference about Martin Luther, how he taught that, that diabolical doctrine that all you need is faith, you don't need works. But St. James in his epistle says, is your brother in need? Is he cold and starving? And you just say, warm yourself or be filled. What does that accomplish if you don't give him? And so this is one of the works of penance, what, what the church calls the three great works of penance, prayer, fasting, alms deeds. So during Lent, we should do something in each of these categories. Our prayer may be to add, again, the stations, the extra rosary, whatever it may be. Prayers in honor of the Passion. Sorrowful Mother Chaplet is another good one. So we have something in prayer and meditation. Then fasting would encompass all forms of physical penance. And then finally, alms deeds would cover all forms of charity. Now, this coming Monday, you know how every weekday of Lent has a proper Mass. So on a ferry of Lent, you don't just say the Mass of the previous Sunday like you would at other times during the year on a ferry. But each day of Lent has a proper Mass. And it's beautiful because we read epistles and Gospels that we don't normally read during the course of the year. Many of the epistles are taken from prophets in the Old Testament and then gospels of stories that, that we don't otherwise read on Sundays. Well, this coming Monday, the Lenten Mass has a parable or a instruction, a story from our Lord taken from the 25th chapter of St. Matthew. And it's a beautiful story. Now, of course, unfortunately, maybe I shouldn't say unfortunately, but Monday is also the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, so this year I will be saying the Mass of St. Thomas and commemorating the Feria. But the Gospel for the Feria is this. Our Lord said that, as we mentioned here, the last lecture, the Son of Man will come again on the last day, and he will gather together all men before him. And as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats, so he, our Lord, the Son of Man, will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left, meaning the, the good and the evil. And he will say to those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my Father, into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, because I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. Naked, and you clothed me. Harborless, and you sheltered me. I was sick and you visited me, or in prison, and you visited me. And the just will say, Lord, when did we see you? Hungry, thirsty, naked, in prison, sick, etc., and minister to you. And he will say to them, as long as you did it, for the least of my brethren, you did it for me. Come into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And to the wicked on his left, he will say, Depart from me, you cursed ones, into everlasting fire, because I was hungry, and you did not give me to eat. I was thirsty, and you did not give me to drink. Naked, you did not clothe me. Uh, without shelter, and you did not shelter me, etc. The, the corporal works of mercy. And they will say, Lord, we never saw you hungry or thirsty, or without shelter, etc. When did we see you? and not minister to you. And he will say to them, as long as you did not do it, for one of the least of my brethren, neither did you do it to me. Depart into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Depart from me from all eternity. Imagine how consoling those words, venite a me benedicti, come to me, blessed ones. And then how frightful those words, dishedite a me, Maligni, depart from me, you wicked ones. But notice, and this is, a, again, a great story. So make sure on Monday you read the gospel, even if Father has the Mass of St. Thomas Aquinas. Read the gospel for the Monday of the Ferial Mass of the first week of Lent. And reflect upon this. 
do I practice the works of mercy? Do I practice the corporal works of mercy? It's something we should keep in mind. So alms deeds, which would include all forms of charity, not just giving money to those in need, but anything we do that's a charitable work for another would come under alms deeds. So that's a good thing to ask ourselves. So the, the author here of the book says, this is the sixth condition for our prayers to be accepted is that they be united with good works. The seventh condition that he gives, our prayer must be confident. Confident. That means we have trust that our Lord will answer our prayers. If we pray with an attitude, well, I'm going to pray because I know I'm supposed to, but I probably won't get what I ask for. Our, our Lord probably won't grant it. Well, then we won't receive it because we lack that confidence. So we have to pray with confidence, which means trust. Trust in God and in his goodness. And our Lord once was talking about this, and he said, you, parents, you being evil as you are, after all, we're all sinners, right? He said, if you fathers, evil as you are, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will not your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And that's when our Lord was saying those words, knock and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you, seek and you shall find, ask and you shall receive, etc. knock and it shall be opened to you. So, confidence in prayer, trust in prayer. And the author of this book, Father Michael Mueller, his book, Prayer, the Key to Salvation, tells an interesting story. And he says, and this was, this was a true story, and occurred in the 1800s in Scotland. Now, at that time, there were very few Catholics in Scotland. And even to this day, not, maybe not a lot more. But at that time, because of the results of the Reformation, there were not very many Catholics. And because of the persecution of priests, they were maybe not being put to death or anything, but being disliked, etc. It was to the point where priests would often travel around in civilian clothing. They wouldn't dress as priests because of the abuse and so forth. So there was this one priest who was traveling in the rural area of Scotland. Um, he was traveling in, you know, disguised, I mean, not dressed as a priest. And out in, the, out in the sticks, you know, and he comes across a little cabin. And as he's walking by it, a woman came out from the cabin. And she said, sir, please come in and help me to explain to this man this elderly man who lives here who is dying help me to convince him that he's dying because he says he's not going to die and he's obviously dying and I don't know whether the woman was like a servant, a neighbor a daughter or whatever so the man went in the priest and he, as soon as he entered the sick room he could see this man is dying and he said to him sir, surely you are dying you should prepare for death. And the man said, no, I'm not going to die right now. And the priest said, well, how, how do you, why do you say that? And he said, well, from the time I was a child, I prayed every day that I would not die without a Catholic priest. And so I can't die because I don't have a priest here. And the, the priest, of course, marveled at the confidence of this man's prayer. He was so convinced that God would allow a priest to be there when he died that he told the, the woman, the servant or daughter, whoever she was, neighbor, that he was not going to die because there was no priest around. And here, just by divine providence, this priest happened to be journeying by that area and the woman happened to ask him in to help her convince this man that he's dying and he should prepare for death. So the priest asked the woman if he could talk to the man privately, closed the door, and told him, I'm a Catholic priest. And the man, of course, went to confession and received uh, extreme unction and was prepared and died. But the, the beautiful thing about this story 
is the confidence that this man had, absolute total confidence. And there are other examples I could give, other books you might read that bring this out. But the point here is this, we have to have trust. Our Lord said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And we often fail to receive because we lack confidence. And why would we not have confidence? Is it because our Lord doesn't love us enough to give us what we need to help us? Of course not. Is it because he's not able to do it? Of course not. He's almighty. So why would we lack confidence? But sadly, we often do. So that's a condition here he gives us. The seventh condition for prayer is to pray with confidence. And he goes on in many pages to talk about this condition. So I'm going to turn past them to get to the next, the couple more conditions that he gives for prayer, for good, a good prayer. Number eight, our prayer must be persevering. We can't just pray once or twice. We have to continue to pray with confidence, with humility, with all of these good qualities. And if we persevere in prayer, we shall obtain what we ask. But we can't just ask once or twice and think, well, that I should get it then, because I asked. And of course, we have the wonderful example of St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, who prayed for him, who offered her tears and her penances and her prayers to Almighty God every day for the conversion of her wayward son, Augustine, who not only was finally converted, but became a great saint, doctor of the church, writer, and again, a great saint. There would not have been an Augustine had there not been a Monica. So she didn't give up. So persevering in our prayer, continue to ask day after day for what you need. And again, for the spiritual things, for the good of our soul. And he gives one last um, quality. Actually, that is the last one, persevering prayer. So this is a great book to uh, increase your confidence in prayer, your appreciation of the value of prayer, and your um, efforts at acquiring these qualities, which are so important to make our prayer successful. Now, before we end this day of retreat, it would not be complete without spending a few minutes on our Blessed Mother, because Our Lady is truly the mediatrix of all graces. We could never comprehend the love that Jesus has for his mother. And if our Lord is the best of all sons, then he must love his mother more than a good son in this world. And indeed he does. And he cannot refuse her requests. So she is all powerful with her son. And in fact, in the book on true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Louis Marie de Montfort quotes a saint who said all things, Mary included, are subject to the empire of God. And all things God included are subject to the empire of Mary. Now, some people might hear that and think, oh, that's blasphemy. God being subject to her, but he was. What does it say after the three days lost in the temple and Mary and Joseph found him in the temple? He returned with them and was subject to them. He, the Son of God, subject to whom? To his creatures, Mary and Joseph. So the devotion taught by St. Louis Marie de Montfort called total consecration or perfect consecration to Jesus through Mary is one of a total consecration in which we give ourselves and all we are, all we have, to Jesus through Mary. And St. Louis says, really, all we're doing is imitating what our Lord himself did. Because he was subject to his mother. And so he came to us through Mary. He came into this world by being born of the Virgin Mary. And so we go back to him by the same channel through which he came to us. So we call our Blessed Mother the Mediatrix of all graces. We also call her the Co-Redemptrix. 
And that is an important title to reflect upon during Lent. And what that means is that even though God had no absolute need of Our Lady to accomplish our redemption, nevertheless, he willed to give her an important part to play because everything that God does is harmonious, is orderly. There's a reason behind it. Well, look at the fall of Adam and Eve. Adam was the head of the human race. And it is because of the sin of Adam that we were born with original sin on our souls. But Eve cooperated in that sin. In fact, she was the first who ate of the forbidden fruit and gave it to Adam. So the human race was affected, adversely affected, greatly affected, by the disobedience of a man and a woman, disobeying God's command. And thus the redemption of the human race would fittingly be brought about by the obedience of a man and a woman. So Jesus, St. Paul tells us, was obedient even unto death, to the death on the cross. And Mary, by her obedience and her love, of Almighty God in her perfect fulfillment of his holy will, repaired our disobedience. So she was united with our Lord. When he died on the cross, her heart was pierced by a sword. That prophecy of Simeon, thy own soul a sword shall pierce. Interesting words. A sword did not pierce her body. He said, thy soul a sword shall pierce. And grief of soul is even greater, more painful than pain of the body. Just as the soul is far more valuable than the body, so grief of soul is a far greater martyrdom than pain of the body. And Our Lady was there at the foot of the cross suffering in her soul and throughout his passion. We have what we call the seven sorrows of Our Lady, beginning with that prophecy of Simeon and the flight into Egypt and the loss of the child Jesus in the temple for three days. And then the other four sorrows during the Passion, her meeting with her son on the way to Calvary, her standing at the foot of the cross when his body was taken down and laid in her arms and she was able to see at close range those gaping wounds on this precious body that she had held as an infant. And then when the body of our Lord was laid in the tomb and the stone was rolled over the entrance, the seven sorrows of Our Lady. So she deserves the title of co-redemptrix because she united her pain, her sufferings, her sorrows with the, the pain of our Lord in his crucifixion and death. She united her suffering with him, with his sorrows, his suffering, for our redemption. When Jesus said, and this is the third word from the cross, when he said, woman, behold thy son. And then he said to St. John, behold thy mother. The fathers of the church tell us, she at that moment became our spiritual mother. She adopted us, knowing that it cost her the death of her son. And St. Bonaventure said something interesting. He said, Mary's prayers are so powerful with God that if at the foot of the cross she were all of a sudden to say, stop, Jesus, come down from the cross. Stop this suffering. He would have done so. But she did not. She did not ask that the passion be ended because she knew it was God's will and she knew it was for us, her children. There's a story told about um, one of the saints, and I, I think it was St. Gertrude, but one saint who was a mystic, and she had a vision of our Blessed Mother with her cape, a big cape. And under the cape, on each side of Our Lady, there were wild animals and beasts. And she was very surprised, and she said to our Blessed Mother, what are all these wild animals that you are sheltering under your cape? And Our Lady said, these animals represent sinners. 
and I am shielding them from the wrath of my divine son, praying for their repentance and conversion. We call Our Lady in the litany of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We have that invocation, refuge of sinners, pray for us. She is truly our refuge. So getting back to what I was saying earlier, the devotion called the total consecration to Jesus through Mary. If there is anyone here who never made that act of consecration, I would like to recommend that you learn about it by reading the book, and then you go through the preparation that St. Louis recommends, which is a period of 33 days of saying certain prayers and readings from Scripture and from the imitation of Christ, etc. And you go through that preparation, and then you make the act of consecration, which he wrote out, and it's a good thing to renew it, especially every year on the anniversary of your consecration, as well as on special feasts of Our Lady. Like this month, we have coming up the Annunciation. And that is a, St. Louis says, that's the, the primary feast for this act of consecration. Because we see God the Son becoming incarnate in her womb and totally dependent upon her. And this is a devotion by which we become of our own free will totally dependent upon Mary. So it is a grace, we believe, given to us in our times to help us persevere. You know, if God put us in the world, in the 21st century, at a time when society has turned so far from God, there are so many moral evils in the world, and we find the remnant church, true Catholics, reduced to a small number. If he put us in the world at this time in history, then he will give us all the graces and helps we need to persevere and save our souls. God would not put someone in a position and not give that person the aids that he needs. And let us remember also what scripture says of Almighty God, that God does not will the death of the sinner, but that he should be converted and live. God desires the salvation of all men. Sadly, the vast majority reject his love, his invitation. They pre prefer to live a life centered in themselves and on sin and end up losing their immortal souls. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, who wrote the book True Devotion, also wrote a, like a pamphlet or a booklet called The Friends of the Cross, a letter to the Friends of the Cross. Because he said, if you're a true Christian, you're a friend of the cross. Because did not Jesus say, if you will be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. But in that book he said, really, there are two groups in the world. And only two groups. There are those who are followers of the cross and those who are followers of the world. Because there are a lot of Catholics who are not living as disciples of Christ crucified. They're living more as followers of the world. So we do not want to be just members of the true church, the mystical body of Christ, the Holy Roman Catholic Church. We also want to be a disciple of Christ crucified. And the saints say, many saints say this, can you imagine the incongruity of the head being crowned with thorns and the members resting on pillows and all kinds of comfort? What do they mean by this? Christ is the head of his church. Christ is the head of the mystical body and we are the members. And look at how the head lived, and especially how he suffered and died for us. So would it not be a contradiction if we strive to live our life in this world constantly pursuing comfort and pleasure and whatever appeals to the senses? So let us remember that those sacrifices we perform during Lent, no doubt very small compared to what the saints did, they are our little way 
of trying to imitate our Lord, of saying, dear Jesus, yes, I want to be your true disciple. I want to take up my cross and follow you. But let us remember not to just let this Lent be a time of penance and prayer, etc. And then Easter comes and we just give it all up. Yes, it's not the same degree of mortification and self-denial, but we always have to die to self. If thou wilt be my disciple, deny thyself. Take up thy cross and follow me. And the goal of Lent is an amendment of life. That when Easter comes, when we've completed Lent, we are better for it. We don't go back into our faults and failings and, and sins. We, we get rid of them. We grow out of them. We, we rise above them. And we live a new life with our Lord. A risen life. That, that theme of the resurrection. So let us also, during this Lent, do our penances, concentrate on our prayer life, strive to pray better, but also strive to amend. No doubt, every one of us, however many times we've done this day of recollection and however many you have attended, there's always something more that I can do, we should each say to ourselves, that I can do to improve, to become more Christ-like, more pre pleasing to God, more pleasing to our Lord and our Blessed Mother. There is something I can do to amend. Let that be our goal for this Lent, to make a good Lent, and to become better for it. Please kneel in reflection.